I can't decide. We, we sang him 186 this morning. I thought, man, it's got to be my favorite Watts. Until we just sang 195. And I always, I always go back and forth between 186 and 195, which is my favorite Watts hymn. Usually whichever one I just sang, so for now, 195. All right, we started John 6 last time together. We'll be back in John 6. We covered the first 15 verses. And then there's a brief narrative before John goes on to a, a, a lengthy narrative, which of course we won't be able to tackle all at once. Um, but we left off verse 15. Let's read together the first 21 verses to get a bit of context here. John chapter 6, begin reading in verse 1. Let's hear the word of the Lord. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about five thousand in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by Himself. When evening came, His disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Let's go before him in prayer. O oh Lord, we bow before you, the, the King of all creation. You have made everything by the word of your power. And you sustain it by your power, even on this Sabbath day, a day of rest for us. We pray now that you take this word that you've inspired, that you would write it on our hearts, that it would take root in us, that you would give us understanding and insight into it, that we might bring our lives into accordance with its teachings, that we would uh, be servants to the word, that we would uh, be found obedient to the teachings of your word, that you would fill us with your spirit, Lord, that we would uh, be speaking this word one to another, we pray that Christ would be glorified in our midst, for we have gathered to worship Him, to thank Him and praise Him for who He is, and for what great things He has done for us. And it's in His name that I pray. Amen. So John chapter 6, verse 16, we'll pick up this, this second miracle or sign, if you will, that John records for us that he has in common with the other gospel writers. Uh, Brother David read for us previously from Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27, 
about the first time that Jesus showed his authority over uh, the stormy seas. And he was in the boat at that time with his disciples, and he was asleep. And Mark says he was asleep on the pillow, which means he was sleeping good. And the disciple, he was sleeping so good, the storm uh, hadn't disturbed his nap. And the disciples, uh, seasoned fishermen, are having trouble getting the boat to go where they want it to go due to the storm. And so they wake Jesus up, and Jesus, from the boat, stills the storm. Uh, that account is in, as Brother David read, Matthew 8, 23 through 27. It's also found, Mark 4, 35 through 41. And then Luke, verses, chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. The passage before us uh, is recorded in John's Gospel, only the, the second miracle of Jesus that John has, uh, one of only two that John has in common with the other Gospel writers. Uh, Matthew and Mark also record for us this walking on water. John does not record the, the first uh, miracle of Jesus stilling the storm from the boat. So we're going to consider this, this short narrative before us. I believe there's enough here for us to learn from uh, Jesus walking on the water. But let's get a bit of, of context. Uh, we saw last week that Jesus is Lord over elements. He took five barley loaves, turned them into uh, bread aplenty to feed 5,000 men. Maybe that was a total number. Maybe there were more women and children. Maybe it was a, a five-figure crowd. At any rate, thousands of people ate from a small boy's lunch. Uh, Jesus provided from his own power uh, for the needs of their bodies. And they had a, a response to that, and it was that they wanted to make him king. And Jesus perceived this, and so he, went, he retreated into the mountain and sent the crowds home. And it's... It's both ironic and tragic that the blessings of God are so often misunderstood by mankind to the point where they will forsake God because He doesn't give them more of those blessings, those material blessings. We're actually going to see this toward the end of chapter 6. Um, in, in verse 66, many of His disciples turned back and no longer walked with Him at the end of Jesus' lengthy discourse on being the bread of life. They didn't want Jesus. They wanted more bread for their bellies. They didn't want bread of life for their souls. And so they turned and left Jesus. Jesus here has just performed an unparalleled miracle that was not just impressive for its demonstration of power, for it certainly was, but it was immensely practical. They got something out of it. Someone who can take a little and make it abundant has great appeal to those who have a little and want an abundance. So this, this was a pretty important uh, person to be around. You're, at least your stomach's going to be full. Might hear some interesting teaching on the side. So of course the people of Israel tried to make him a king. But we know that Jesus is the king of kings and he doesn't need man to go find a throne for him. He's already king of kings Lord of Lords. And these fickle Jews were soon enough going to raise a cross for him, much less a throne. They were going to cry out, His blood be on us and our children. But they wanted a king to provide for their physical needs, and Jesus, again, ironically enough, and praise be to God, was going to use that very cross to provide for their spiritual needs, and ours as well. R.C. Sproul had a wonderful summary that I don't typically read at length from from other commentators. Um, this isn't just a story hour, but I, I thought what R.C. Sproul had to say was, was very well written, and so I want to read you a, a paragraph from our brother R.C., who's now uh, worshiping uh, with his faith being sight. Uh, he wrote, Remember that at this time in Jewish history, when the people were under Roman occupation, the Passover, mentioned in chapter 6, verse 4, was not just an exciting and important religious festival. It was the supreme celebration of national pride. Americans' celebration of the 4th of July is not worthy to be compared to the Jews' experience of Passover, 
when they reaffirmed their hope that God would deliver them from the tyranny of Rome. So while this frenzy was going on, stoking the people's hopes for someone to deliver them from the yoke of Roman tyranny, the perfect political candidate appeared on the scene. He even provided that which wins political votes everywhere, a chicken in every pot or a loaf and a fish in every lunch. R.C. had good humor. It doesn't get any better than that. The people said, this is the kind of king we want, one that will care for us from the cradle to the grave. But Jesus read their hearts, and he knew that the kind of king they were looking for had nothing to do with the kind of kingdom he had come to inaugurate. They were looking for the kingdom of man. He came to bring the kingdom of God. It was his mission to provide his people with so much more than bread and fishes. That was a good word from R.C., I thought. Help give a little light on the, the passage before us. So Jesus has now left the crowd, gone up back up into the mountain. And while John is the, the only gospel that he, remember, he and uh, Matthew and Mark also record this event of walking on the water. While John is the only gospel to record that the people tried to make him king, we saw in verse 15, John is the only gospel that does not mention that Jesus made his disciples depart by boat to the opposite shore. Matthew records that for us in Matthew 14, verse 22, and Mark also in Mark 6, verse 45. Luke in his gospel indicates that this miracle took place in the desert by Bethsaida. That's in Luke 9, verse 10. And John says they are, are sailing to Capernaum. In, in John 6, verse 17. However, in Mark's gospel, he says that they were sailing to Bethsaida on the other side in chapter 6, verse 45. So on the Sea of Galilee, the, the harp-shaped sea, where are they sailing to? Where are they presently? Well, the pulpit commentary helps clear this up. Are they sailing from Bethsaida to Bethsaida? Yes, uh, pulpit commentary, Hendrickson, a couple of these guys mentioned that there are actually two Bethsaidas. And one is Bethsaida Julius, which is on the northeastern coast of the Sea of Galilee, which is where the Jesus' disciples are presently. And then there's Bethsaida of Galilee that is so close to Capernaum, which is on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee, that the, the port of Bethsaida of Galilee is often considered a port for Capernaum uh, to enter that, that city that way. Uh, so they were sailing from one Bethsaida really to another uh, near Capernaum and is a very short distance that they had to travel, not, not very much uh, sailing time between the two, less than two miles in the water uh, separated these two ports. But as for the crowds, they have eaten their fill and they have now been commanded by their benefactor uh, to return home to their villages. Matthew recorded that again in Matthew 14, 22. Let's go ahead and turn there. We'll keep, keep referring to these two passages. In my, in my Bible, I kept flipping back and forth so many times. I had three bookmarks. I have one in Matthew, one in Mark, one in John, just going back and forth reading them. Matthew 14, verse 22 Immediately he, speaking of Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, verse 23, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. So after Jesus has dismissed the crowds, they've gone to their homes. Uh, the disciples have gone into the boat and Jesus enters alone into prayer on the mountain. So Jesus is now seeking his Father's face. He's, he's all by himself. And I wanted to pause and reflect on Jesus praying some things I think we can 
learn from the, the prayer life of, of Jesus as he's on the mountain, uh, it's interesting to think of Jesus praying. Uh, it is to me anyway to, to, to consider Jesus going before the Lord in prayer. Um, what would he pray about? Jesus has no sin to confess. I mean, there's nothing for him to go before God and say, Lord, forgive me for this. That takes up a healthy percentage of my prayers, just asking for forgiveness, confessing sin. Uh, not, not trying to you know, be super spiritual or anything, just saying that's the nature of prayer oftentimes. Jesus has no physical ailment to ask healing for. That that's again, takes up a healthy percentage of my prayers, praying for other people to be well in, in body uh, as they are in soul. And Jesus has no physical ailment. He's not asking for God to heal him of anything. Uh, what could his prayers consist of? Well, praising God in prayer. Something that, I, again, in my prayers is often overlooked. Just praising God as we meditate on who he is and the, the glory of his attributes and his character as he's revealed himself in his word. And so, Jesus, even though he has no sin to confess, he's not asking for God to heal him or give him wisdom or insight or understanding into anything. What is he going up to the, prayer to, what is he going up to the mountain to pray for? Well, maybe to praise God. Maybe to intercede for others. So, praising God, even if we have nobody to pray for healing to come for, even if we're not going specifically to, to ask God to forgive us, we can always go to God and should go to God. As we pray without ceasing, we should be praising Him for who He is, uh, for His glorious nature. Secondly, something to, uh, to consider, uh, praising God in, in private prayer is, is necessary. That He is worthy of to be praised by your lips no less than every moment of your existence. That we ought to be telling God how glorious He is. Not that He needs to hear it. Not that He's some kind of narcissist and wants people to tell Him how, how great He is. He knows how great He is far better than we do. But we were made for that. We were made to praise God. We were made to glorify Him and to worship Him. And then thirdly, as... We consider the time of day. Verse 16 begins with when evening came. Uh, Jesus is going up into the mountain that it's never too late in the day to praise God in prayer. All times of the day are good for praising God in prayer. The nighttime moments, yes, those are oftentimes when we're at our weariest. When the, the sun has been set and we are tired from the day's work. But it's an encouraging example of uh, Jesus here, the, the nighttime is, is a prime opportunity oftentimes to go before the Lord in prayer. When everybody is in bed and they're resting and you can contemplate on your bed uh, the happenings of the day, the providences of God, things that you learned of Him, things that He taught you. Uh, it's a wonderful time to reflect on the ventures of the day, to commit the, the labors of the day to God and ask for His blessing on it. Lest the Lord build the house, they, they who build it labor in vain. So to commit our work to the Lord and ask for His blessing on it. Uh, for us sinners, it's also profitable to reflect on our sins of the day and to ask for forgiveness uh, at least once every 24 hours. Keep short accounts with God. Get, if there's something between us and the Lord, get it cleared up right away. Don't let that turn into uh, bitterness, backsliding, or even worse, apostasy but to clear these things up with the Lord, uh, that sin has, does not reign in our, in our bodies. So, as Jesus goes uh, to pray, what happens with His disciples? The text does not focus on the crowds for a while, not until verse 22. The text uh, refers to the narrative, uh, strongly features the disciples. Well, they, we read in verse 16, went down to the sea. In verse 17, they got in a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. Now, this wasn't premature on their part. We remember from Matthew's account that he, Jesus told them, Go ahead, go. Take off. This wasn't presumptuous on their part. They weren't uh, mad at Jesus. They, nothing like that. Jesus had told them, Go ahead, sail. Um, 
In verse 22 of Matthew 14, that was. He made them get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. They were obeying Jesus. Nothing wrong in what they did. Uh, and we read verse 17 goes on that it was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. Jesus had not yet come to them. Of course, John writing uh, the, his gospel last, the, the readers are going to know that Jesus is going to come. John is saying he's not come yet. They're sailing just by themselves uh, in verse 17. And so they're, they're obeying Jesus. They're doing exactly what he told them. And then verse 18 introduces some um, new happenings. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. Very simply stated by the apostle there in verse 18. The sea became rough. And, of course, the Sea of Galilee is several hundred feet below sea level, and it, sea level with the, the Mediterranean, and it has mountains all around, and so the winds come down off the mountains and stir up the sea, and it's uh, frequently given to uh, rather tempestuous winds. And so one of these winds was now blowing on the disciples. Uh, the Greek word for strong here that the ESV has, a strong wind was blowing, is the Greek word mega. It's a mega wind, big wind. This is a, a serious storm. And the wind was blowing because the master of the land, sea, and sky had ordained it to blow. There's not a renegade breeze in the whole world. It was blowing because Jesus intended for it to blow, that he might increase the faith of his disciples. Even though they've just come down, from the mountain where they saw Jesus multiply the loaves. They themselves took up the fragments. Uh, their faith must still be increased. And of course the Lord wondrously increases our faith through His miraculous provision of blessings. We, as we trust the Lord to provide, we pray to Him for our daily bread and then He supplies that. Our faith grows. We, we see perceive our God as trustworthy. He does provide for us. But if that was all that He ever did for us, that kind of faith would ferment into a bitter presumption on the mercies of God. And so the Lord complements His blessings with trials and with difficulties that our faith would be well-rounded and grounded in the God who is sovereign over all, the good times and the bad, and precisely dispenses all trials and blessings for the ultimate good of each of His children. And such was the case with these disciples. They've been blessed, they've got a full belly, now they're in the boat obeying their Lord, and now there's a storm on the sea. What well, is the favor of God no longer with us? Oh, no, 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 it certainly is. It certainly is. This is another way that Jesus is going to grow their faith. And so, verse 19, the narrative continues, when they had rowed about three or four miles. Let's just pause there for a minute. Three or four miles. The Sea of Galilee is, as we mentioned last week, something like a really big lake. It was about seven miles from the, the easternmost shore to the westernmost shore, and from the northernmost shore to the southernmost shore, it's only 11 miles. Not, not, not that big of a, of a sea. To row three or four, and to, when you're only needed to go less than two, they've rowed out into the middle of the sea at this point. Such is the nature of the storm. They're way off track. Uh, the, the Greek is 25 or 30 uh, stadia, which is little less than 200 meters. Uh, so they've been rowing for uh, quite a distance, and they still have not reached their destination. They're now into the middle of the sea, where they didn't, weren't even trying to get to. And Matthew has some additional information for us. Uh, he tells us a little bit more about the, the time of day. Uh, verse 24, But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, Matthew 14, verse 24, beaten by the waves... For the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, He, speaking of Jesus, came to them walking on the sea. 
and the fourth watch of the night. That phrase that Matthew uses uh, is from the Roman timetable, which would have been, uh, fourth watch for the Romans would have been from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. So these guys have been rowing since evening three or four miles. They had less than two to travel, and they're now in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the night. All the middles you don't want except that Jesus had a lesson to teach them. As if the wind wasn't terrifying enough. And and these are seasoned fishermen. Their fears are doubled because they've rowed three or four miles. It's the dead of night. They're tired. What do they see? Well, we pick up in John 6... Look back over there. You might want to keep one finger in Matthew 14, one in John 6. What do they see in the middle of verse 19? They saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. Here's some progress that's being made. Jesus is coming near the boat. And their fears, as if they couldn't be heightened any, they see this ghost-like figure. Look in uh, Matthew 14, verse 26. When the disciples saw Him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. These were uh, these disciples, which are twelve at this point. Uh, the end of chapter 6 tells us there are twelve disciples. Um, they've all been chosen by now. Among those 12 disciples were at least four seasoned fishermen. Andrew, Peter, James, and John were all doing fishing business when Jesus called them to Himself. These guys, they knew the sea. They had fished this sea. And they've, they've certainly experienced storms before. They've never seen a ghost walking on the sea. This is something that they are completely uh, unprepared for. And this human form, this ghost that's on the sea, this sea, the storm is not affecting them at all. They're walking on the sea. They can't get their boat to go where they want it, and this person is headed straight for their boat on the sea, unaffected by the storm. Nothing's phasing this ghost. <laughs> the disciples might have been asking themselves, what was in those barley loaves that were multiplied? That some, something's going on here. Never seen this before. And Matthew and Mark also tell us they they thought they'd seen a ghost. They did come to recognize that it was Jesus. The same Jesus that had retreated to the mountain. John says, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. And coming near the boat. And they were frightened. Why should they be frightened? Frightened. This was Jesus who had just provided for them. He had just filled their bellies. Was he now going to let them drown with a full stomach in the middle of the sea when he had told them to sail to the other side? He had just gone to the mountain to pray, maybe to intercede on their behalf. Was he now going to be unsympathetic to their struggle? Jesus walks near the boat on the stormy sea. No man, to this day, on their own power, has even walked over a calm sea. Jesus walked through the stormy waters. Peter, other Gospels tell us that Peter called out and said, Lord, if it's you... Let me come to you on the water. That's back in Matthew 14, verse 28. Maybe Peter recognized the sound of Jesus' voice when he said, Take heart, it's I, do not be afraid. Peter, the same Peter that said, Don't wash my feet, now wash me all over. Says, Lord, this storm's pretty bad in the boat. Let me just walk on the water with you. It's like, Peter, what do you you think you're going to drown anyway? You might as well drown in pursuit of the Lord. And he and the Lord says, okay, come, Peter. And for a while, Peter, under the strength of the Lord, does walk on the water toward Jesus. 
And then he took his eyes off the Lord. Verse 30 says he saw the wind and he began to sink. And that's when we begin to sink is when we take our eyes off the Lord and start putting them on circumstances. That will depress your soul. That's why we must keep our eyes fixed upon the Lord. And so, the storm does not affect Jesus. Uh, He has all power to send the storm. He has all power to still the storm. And so Jesus walking on the water to His disciples is meant to teach them that He does not need man to enthrone Him. These men that were impressed with the, the, the free meal they got, Jesus doesn't need their enthronement. He's Lord of earth and wind and sky, of heaven and earth, and all the beings therein are His. He made everything out of nothing. He can certainly make any number of loaves out of crumbs. Not impossible for Jesus. He rules over heaven and earth. It's His domain. Every last drop of water obeys Him. Not a drop doesn't do what He wants it to do. If only every human being were that way. God help us. And so Jesus comes near the boat. The disciples are frightened. And Jesus, sympathetic to the plight of His disciples, says, verse 20, It is I. Do not be afraid. Very simple statement from the Lord. Very important statement. Verse 20 is the first use in the Gospel of John of the, the Greek phrase, ego eimi, which in Greek is, literally means I, I am. It's a very important statement. It's the same construction that's used when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, in John 8, verse 58. This is the phrase that is used to translate the first part of the divine name of God in Exodus 3.14 in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament Hebrew Scriptures. Ego eimi is the phrase that's used there. I am. When when Moses asked God, what's the name of the God that I should tell the Hebrews that sent me? God says, I am that I am. The first part of that is ego eimi in the Septuagint. And so John, the same John that wrote, and the word was God, right here says, I am. Jesus says, I am, do not be afraid. And John makes great use of this phrase. One, a beautiful study. Study out all the I am sayings in John's gospel. We're going to, Lord willing, hit all of them in our, if Lord tarries, we'll hit all of them in our exposition of John. Uh, it, it appears in uh, here in John 6.20 is the first usage. It appears in John 8.58, before Abraham was, I am. It appears in John 6.35, I am the bread of life. Nothing else satisfies the human soul but Jesus. It appears in John 8.12, I am the light of the world. All other religions are darkness. It appears in John 10 verse 9, I am the door, says Jesus. All other ways to God are false. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I am the one that tends to your soul. John 15, 1, I am the true vine. The nourishment that the spiritual life and vitality that flows to us, flows to us through the true vine, Jesus. That's not given anywhere else. All other religions are dead. Dead ideologies of men. Only Jesus is the true vine. Wonderful statement, ego eimi, I am. John did not accidentally call Jesus, did not call the word God in John 1.1. This just flows through John's gospel, this high Christology. Jesus is I am. Jesus is the one that spoke to Moses on the mount. And if you don't believe that I am, Jesus says, you will perish in your sins. You have to believe Jesus is God to be saved. No one who believes Jesus is a mere prophet is saved. No one who believes He was some good philanthropist is saved. If you do not believe that I am, you're dead in your sins. The soldiers, when Jesus says, I am, the the posse that comes to arrest Him, they fall back to the ground. 
the divine force of, of that name. So Jesus is the supreme God who is over all. He comes to them and says, It is I, do not be afraid. And this is how deliverance comes to a sinner. Except that Jesus comes to us, we should be afraid of Him. As long as He's the God sitting on His throne who judges all and rules over all, and as long as he, if, if He does not come to us, we ought to be afraid of Him. We ought to fear Him. Because we are sinners. We are His disobedient creatures. And we ought to fear Him except He condescend to come to us and speak peace to us. We ought to fear Him. And when Jesus comes to a sinner, He reveals Himself to them and speaks to them and says, It is I. I am. Do not be afraid. And He can speak peace to the sinner and calm their fears. Verse 21 closes out this narrative. Then they, the disciples, were glad to take Him into the boat. The Lord had spoken peace to them. And immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Another miracle. Gravity does not bind the Son of God. He walks on water. Time and space do not bind the Son of God either because the moment He got in the boat, the boat was at the shore. Time and space do not bind Jesus. The storm is stilled, Matthew 14 tells us. 14 verse 32. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. It was done. Jesus just provided for the needs of a few thousand people who are not His own, who are actually going to forsake Him. How could He fail to provide for the needs of a few, twelve, who are His own? So He tells them, why did you doubt? I just fed these people that don't even know my mission, don't love me. They just want me for a meal ticket, and I just provided for them. You think you're really going to drown out here? Why do you doubt, oh, you of little faith? Jesus tells them. And again, the miracles of Jesus when He provides for physical needs are meant to teach us that He can, of His abundant strength and knowledge and wisdom, provide for our spiritual needs. And life without Jesus is one big storm. If you're saved, you know that it is. Because we were all a storm before the Lord entered our vessel. Life without Jesus is one big storm. It's a mess. It's purposeless. It's meaningless. It's useless. Just completely nihilistic. There's no meaning, no point to life apart from Jesus. It's just one big storm of frustrating circumstances. And to make matters worse, all human effort cannot avail against the storms of life. You can row as long as you want to, as hard as you want to. It's not going to avail. It's not going to help you navigate the storms, the seasons of life. It's just going to be endless struggles, moving from one rough patch to another. And Without Jesus, you look around and it's all just rough all around you. But once Jesus has possessed your vessel, once He is on board, now your life has direction. Now it's on course for the first time. And you will arrive safely at your destination, home in heaven. So by way of conclusion, which Jesus do you have? Do you want Him as a king who will just give you stuff? Well, I'm I'm happy to be Jesus' creature if He just gives me stuff, just meets my physical needs. Or do you worship Him as the king over all creation, as His disciples did when He entered the boat? Again, Matthew 14, And those in the boat worshipped Him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. The only time that phrase appears in Matthew's Gospel. So either Jesus is to you just someone who gives you stuff. He's just a benefactor who lets you breathe His air, wear His clothes, eat His food, play in His world. And you're happy to have Him as that. 
or you worship Jesus as the king over heaven and earth and you bow down to him. Those who only want Jesus to give them stuff, but they don't want Jesus themselves, Jesus will not have you either. And you will depart from him into everlasting torment. That's one of the saddest verses in John's gospel. That verse 66, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. They had Jesus in the flesh and left him. Now he's sitting on the, on the throne at the right hand of God the Father. And we only see him with the eye of faith. But what a tragedy. So, are you one of those who do not follow Jesus, but are glad for him to give you stuff? Or do you worship him for who he is? Because again, these are written, says John in John twenty thirty one. These are written so that you may believe. Do you believe that Jesus is the one? who rules over all things, with whom you will have to do. Which Jesus do you have? Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we are grateful that you do provide all things needful for our bodies. Lord, we pray that from our lips would flow to you endless praise. That we would not only thank you for the the things you give to us, Lord, but that that endless praise and thanks would flow to you for revealing yourself to us, for giving yourself to us, for taking us, wretched humanity, who apart from you coming to us would have left you, deserted you, hated you, yet you have bought us, made us your bride. Lord, we we thank you and we, we praise you for your great love for us, for the provision for all things needful. Help us, Lord, not to doubt you. Increase our faith, O Lord. Help us to keep our eyes fixed upon you and not the circumstances of this life, for they will bog us down and they will overwhelm us. But with our eyes on you, Lord, we cannot fall. So we pray that you would help us, Lord, all the way home to glory, that you would go with us and be near to us, And lead us every step of the way, for you are the good shepherd. And we pray in your name. Amen. And we will close with a hymn together.